Hello, people of God. It's good to be with you once again and to open God's Word together. I want to open God's Word to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 6. Uh, we've been considering the book of Daniel to think about life lived in, in Babylon, uh, as Peter describes life in this world as living in Babylon in, in the first epistle of Peter. Um, we've been thinking about that with the life of Daniel. As we come to chapter 6, we have to actually shift our focus a little bit because Daniel is no longer living life in Babylon. Uh, Daniel is now living life in the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. Um, but we can't now change the title of our thinking from uh, life in Babylon to life in Medio Persia. Uh, it just doesn't roll off the tongue quite as easily. And in any case, you, you can call the kingdom whatever you want, but as the Bible thinks about the kingdom of this world, it thinks of all the kingdoms of this world under that broader heading of Babylon. And so even though uh, the the kingdoms have changed, um, you know, we, we might say with the who, uh, meet, the, meet, the new bo- meet the new boss, same as the old boss, um, that, that really, even though the kingdoms of the world have changed, it still is true that God's people are living life in Babylon. And Daniel helps us to think very importantly about this. I'm going to read the first 18 verses. Once again, I'm going to stop short of the miracle that we all want to read about, uh, God delivering Daniel from the lion's den. But I want to think about the life of Daniel leading up to um, to those events and to think about what we, what we learn from his life. Uh, from these passages. One of the really interesting things about uh, this passage is Daniel doesn't say anything until after he's delivered from the lion's den. And so what we learn about Daniel's life speaks volumes, even though he says nothing um, in these first 18 verses. And so we want to look at his life and want to look at how his life can give us good instruction as people of God who are living um, in in Babylon, uh, the example that we can follow from him. Um, and that we can learn from his life. And so I want to think about Daniel chapter 6. I want to think about the first 18 verses together, and let's pay careful attention, for this is God's own word. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three presidents, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other presidents and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king planned to set over the whole king set him over the whole kingdom. Then the presidents and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or fault, because he was faithful, and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these presidents and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for thirty days except to you, O king shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had his windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before God as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man within thirty days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, 
May your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that nothing may be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Uh, so we'll leave the, the story there. I know, again, I'm breaking off at the, at the interesting part of the story, the neat part of the story, when God works miraculously to save Daniel from the lion's den. Uh, but I want to think about Daniel as this wonderful servant of the Lord as he's been presented to us. Uh, Daniel is a remarkable, a remarkable servant, um, a superior servant both to God and to the kingdoms of men. Um, it's amazing that we read here that as this new kingdom comes, the kingdom that replaces Babylon, uh, we find Daniel still um, in the upper echelons of government. The king is thinking about him making a sin. He's essentially one of the top three th people in the kingdom under the king, and the king is thinking of making him number two in the kingdom. Um, that, that Daniel is, is that valuable to the king, who's shown himself to be that valuable. Um, and as anybody in, in politics would know, if you have a king, if you're that high in position, you have people gunning for you. And we read that every other counselor in the kingdom essentially is gunning for Daniel. Um, they are all, they're all out to get him. And one of the remarkable things that they say about him is that when they try to find reason for a fault or a complaint against him, with regard to the kingdom, they can't find any reason to accuse him, right? We're told in verse four, they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful. What a wonderful thing to be able to say about Daniel. Um, and once again, we, we have to remember when this is happening. Um, we don't know the exact timeline of Daniel's life because we don't know exactly when he's taken into captivity. There was a series of captivities uh, that happened before the eventual fall of Jerusalem. Uh, but Daniel 1 does record the fall of Jerusalem. So we take that as our starting point and say about 586 BC and think of Daniel as being a teenager, probably a young teenager, 13, 14, 15, when, when Judah falls to Babylon. Uh, he's taken away into captivity. Well, we know that Babylon falls to the Medes and Persians um, and about 539 BC, again, again, these dates are not, you know, entirely, you can differ a few years here this way or that way. But what that probably means is Daniel now, as he comes to us, is not the teenage Daniel of chapter one. This is, this is a Daniel probably at least 50 to 60 years old. Uh, one who's been serving in Babylon uh, till his 50s or 60s when it falls. So probably in chapter five, He's 50 or 60 years old uh, when, when Babylon falls. And we don't know how much longer uh, this is for, um, for Daniel, to this, this much later now that Daniel is serving the Medes and the Persians, um, and, and, he's, and he's finding himself in this situation. But what it says to us is that Daniel has spent 50 years of his life, at least 40 years, probably upwards of 50 years of his life now, serving in the government. And we find there's no reason to make a complaint against him. They can't find a reason to complain against, against Daniel. Uh, that's a remarkable thing. May, may we have that kind of faithfulness in our worldly callings that, that in our interactions with our fellow men, someone would be able to come and say, I find no reason for complaint or fault against you. He's a superior servant in the kingdom of men. And even when the king is forced after the trickery of his men to enforce his edict, he clearly doesn't want to. He clearly loves Daniel, seeks to rescue him, uh, prays that Daniel would deliver him, but feels his hands are tied to intervene to save him. Um, it's a remarkable testimony to how Daniel is a superior servant in the kingdom of men, but more so we see that Daniel is a superior servant to the kingdom of God. Because these men come and they say, you know, if we want to try to figure out a way to accuse Daniel, we're not going to find anything in his conduct in the government. Um, because he's without fault, fault. He's of an excellent spirit. There's nothing to accuse him of in his governing the country. If we're going to find a reason to accuse him, it's going to be something in relation to the law of his God. Um, and we see them begin to lay a trap for him um, based on his religious fervor. They know that Daniel is a praying man. And so they seek to attack him in the realm of prayer. 
Um, if we ever wanted to know what it looks like when the Bible says pray without ceasing, that's Daniel. Uh, three times a day we're told uh, his practice. He would go to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. And he got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before God. Um, and they find him one of these days making petition and plea before God um, and use it as an occasion to accuse him. Right? They, they know that he's a man who prays without ceasing. And so they make the king make a decree that anyone who prays for 30 days to anyone but the king will be thrown in the lion's den. And they know that that will trap Daniel because they know that he's a praying man. And they know that if they tell him not to pray, he's going to pray anyway. Um, when God says pray without ceasing and someone says you may not pray, it's clear that you have to obey God rather than men. Um, we can be thankful that we're not living in a time where the government is saying you may not go to church. They're saying you may not gather, um, but nobody is trying specifically to target our religion and keep us from practicing it. That's what these men are doing to Daniel. They're specifically targeting him. right? Even when Nebuchadnezzar set up that great statue that he wanted everyone to bow down to, he wasn't targeting Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men are targeting Daniel. The kingdom might be different, but it's, it's still hostile to the kingdom of God. It still tries to attack that vital connection that the servant of God has to his, to his God. Um, the Daniel, Daniel gets down on his knees and he prays three times a day. Um, prays in the upper chamber. He's not praying it so that people will see what he's doing. But he does pray with his windows open to Jerusalem. Why? Why? Um, well, well, the answer is in what uh, King Solomon said in 1 Kings chapter 8. Um, if we look back to, to 1 Kings chapter 8, um, in, in the dedication of the temple, um, something is said importantly that I think is instructing um, Daniel's practice here. So if we go back to 1 Kings chapter 8, and we look at verses 46 through 51, uh, we read about Sol Solomon dedicating the temple and the prayer that he makes at its dedication. Um, and this is one of the things that, that Solomon says to God in his prayer about the people. He said, If they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you are angry with them, and give them to an enemy, so that they are carried away captive to the land of the enemy, far off or near. Yet if they turn their heart in the land to which they have been carried captive, and repent and plead with you in the land of their captors, saying, we have sinned and we have acted perversely and wickedly. If they repent with all their mind and with all their heart in the land of their enemies, whom you carried them captive, and pray to you toward their land, which you gave to their fathers, the city that you have chosen, and the house that I have built for your name, then hear in heaven your dwelling pray place, their prayer and their plea, and maintain their cause, and forgive your people who have sinned against you and all their transgressions that they have committed against you, and grant them compassion in the sight of those who have carried them captive, that they may have compassion on them. For they are your people and your heritage, which you brought out of Egypt from the midst of the iron furnace. Let your eyes be open to the plea of your servant and to the plea of your people Israel, giving ear to them whenever they call to you. For you separated them from among all the peoples of the earth to be your heritage, as you declared through Moses your servant when you brought our fathers out of Egypt, O Lord God. Uh, Daniel is remembering that prayer of Solomon. And he's remembering it probably with sadness. Uh, the window is open towards Jerusalem, but he knows now that that temple that Solomon built is not standing there. It's born, been torn down. There no longer is a house where God has made his name to dwell there anymore. But there still is the city. The city that God chose. Um, even if there is no temple and there's no longer any king there, there still is that city that God chose. In ruins though it may be. And it's a reminder that God's people are a chosen people and his people are his chosen heritage. And that God has promised to hear his people when they call. 
Here is people when they confess. Here is people when they petition and when they plead for mercy. And here we find Daniel has been doing this three times a day on his knees for decades. Maybe, maybe 50 years, three times a day he's been doing this, praying towards that chosen city, that place where God made his name to dwell, where God promised to hear from heaven when God's people called on his name. Um, and, and he's petitioning God to do what? To forgive them their sins, right? To confess. Why are they carried off? Why were they carried off captive? Because they'd sinned and acted perversely and wickedly. And Daniel was on his knees. That's a posture for, for prayers of confession. Uh, confessing sins, pleading with God to do what? To show mercy. Uh, in, in, that, in that sure hope that God would hear in heaven their, pr- their prayer and their plea and maintain their cause and forgive their people. That's what Daniel's doing for years, three times a day. Um, and not just asking for forgiveness, not just asking for compassion, but giving thanks to God. Giving thanks to God. You know, Daniel's been doing this for 50 years a captive. We, we, we have 12 years a slave. Well, this is, this is 50 years a slave. 50 years a captive. And still he prays. He prays without ceasing. He prays earnestly. He prays for deliverance. He pray, 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 prays for forgiveness. He pray, prays for mercy. And he's thankful. Because he has a God in heaven who hears. And this is such a great lesson to us. That Daniel does the best thing he can do in the circumstances he's in. Is pray to God. And I thought, you know, we've not been 50 years captives. We, we, we've felt like prisoners in our own homes maybe. But it's been, what, eight weeks? And... We see the dedication that this servant of the Lord has for prayer, and it should be convicting to us. You know, as I as I read this and was meditating on it, I thought, you know, if I spend as much time praying as I did grousing about the coronavirus, or frustrated with political responses to it, or wondering what what else we might do in response to it, thinking about all these different directions, and thought, you know, how much time was wasted where I could have been praying about it. Or I could have been making that my reflex. And now we see why such an excellent spirit was in Daniel. He spent his time in prayer. Um, and it's something that we should take note of and that we should seek to emulate in our own lives. This made me think of a, a, a book on pastoral ministry where pastors were, were saying, you know, Nowadays, pastors have so much better education than some of the previous generations had. We have so much more access to information. Um, we have, you know, great libraries at our fingertips. Even if we can carry them around with us on our laptops. You know, we have we have so much more access to things. But this pastor, and this was many years before internet and all those kinds of things, but was saying, you know, in so many ways, we have such so many advantages over previous generations, clergy. Why does it seem that they were so much more effective than we were? Um, if we have so much more stuff today, why, why, did they, why do they seem to be so much more effective? And the answer the, the book gave was very interesting. He said, it's easy to see why. They were more men of prayer than we are. We might have all kinds of worldly advantages, but there was an unction to their ministry. That's a word we don't use much. There was an unction to their ministry. Why? Because they were men of prayer. You know, we're good about, we're good at grousing to each other. We're good at complaining on social media. We're good about, you know, highlighting all the things that we're frustrated with, with our officials, with the situation. And I wonder if we, you know, did a spreadsheet and said, how much time did I spend praying about this? How much time have I spent about venting about this, you know, under my own breath, grumbling to myself, to my friends, to my neighbors on social media? If we turned all that time and made it more productive, how much more wonderful it would be. What a great lesson we have here from this man of God. But he didn't tire of of praying. Fifty years he prayed. 
And when people wanted to try to trap him, they knew prayer was the way to trap him. Um, he was a praying man. That's why he was a powerful man in the service of God. And that would have been true whether he went in and died in the lion's den. Even though he didn't die, but went on to continue to live and to serve both God and men. Um, but this should be a great reminder to us. Daniel was a praying man. That's what we saw in our Lord Jesus Christ. He spent a lot of time in prayer. Communing with his father. And that helped to remind him that there was a kingdom above these kingdoms. There's a world beyond this world. Um, we can become so fixated with the coronavirus and when the regulations will be let up and when we can get back to normal and we can make this world ultimate. It's not. Um, there's another world that's our ultimate home. Another kingdom to which we belong. And the more time we spend communing with that kingdom, communing with our Father in heaven through the king of that kingdom, who is our intercessor, the Lord Jesus Christ, the more our hearts and minds will be lifted up beyond this world and the better fit, fitted we'll be for service in it. Daniel was not so spiritually minded, he was of no earthly good. But he was of such earthly good specifically because he was so heavenly minded. Uh, might God give us that grace to be a praying people. Let's do that right now. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, forgive us for our lack of prayer. Forgive us for all the times that we've grumbled. We know how much you hate grumbling. Um, forgive us for when we didn't turn those grumbles into honest prayers before you. Forgive us for all that wasted time spent complaining to each other and to social media, to the world, um, in such ineffectual ways and how we've missed the wonderful effectiveness of prayer. Lord, may we be like Daniel, praying without ceasing, continually turning our minds and hearts towards the heavenly Jerusalem of which we are citizens, remembering our election, that we've been chosen by you as your people, as your heritage, that you've redeemed for your own, that we would lift our hearts and minds to, to you in heaven and to our King, the Lord Jesus Christ, who rules powerfully and well. And may we be filled with our, our hearts and minds, be filled with the hope of that kingdom. And might the hope of that kingdom be our help here below. For we do confess that there are many things that frustrate us in the world right now. We are frustrated about being separated from one another. We are frustrated that the doors of the churches are closed, that people are missing great events of life, that, that weddings are being ruined, that graduations are being ruined, that uh, people who need to gather for funerals can't gather together as they want to, that people who are have sick loved ones, can't visit them because of uh, the virus. And we can be filled with so much frustration, Lord. And might we first have our minds and hearts turned to the fact that this is what sin has brought on this world. That, that we've created the world that exists in this way. That we've made it the sin-filled, misery-filled place that it is. And as much as we're suffering right now, we know we deserve much worse. We know that our individual sins and sins as a church and sins as a nation are such that we deserve to have the doors of the church closed forever. We deserve to have the gospel taken away from us for our sin and wickedness. That we have sinned, we've acted perversely. Individually, we've failed as a church, we've certainly failed as a nation. And you would be doing no injustice to us by turning your back on us. But we thank you that you are a forgiving God. That you don't turn your back on us for the sake of Jesus Christ. That this restriction of our ability to meet together is temporary. We do have hope, Lord, that we will soon be able to gather again in some capacity in the weeks to come. But help us never to take that for granted. That it's a signal honor of and testimony to your grace that you allow the doors of the church to stay open that you continue to serve us. And so we pray for you for your forgiveness, that you would forgive us as individuals, that you would forgive us as a church for the ways we have failed to do what we should do in the world. We pray that you would forgive us as a country of all the, the many sins that our country has committed, that you would turn people's hearts to, to return to you, 
that you would turn the hearts of our leaders to consider you and your law, to be in step with the Spirit and to do those things which are pleasing in your sight. We pray for the good of our country. We pray for our leaders. We pray for all those who are helping the sick right now, the frontline responders. Pray that you would be with them and keep them safe. Be with all those who are frustrated and, and, and affected by this in body and soul and spirit. Pray that you would watch over us all, Lord, and help us to be a praying people. Help us to continue to lift up our eyes to heaven and realize how much we have in the Lord Jesus Christ and you as our Father through him. That his Spirit is at work in us powerfully to help us. And may we spend more time petitioning you and pleading before your throne and thanking you for what we have than we do grumbling about our lot in life. Help us to be a praying people who pray without ceasing, who ask for all those many things that we need, but also don't fail to remember to give you thanks for all the good gifts you've given, above all the gift of Jesus Christ. So bless us and keep us, Lord. Give us what we've asked, not because we deserve it, but because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. People of God, may the Lord bless you and keep you until we can meet again.